So here we are. Let's um, let's continue with our discussion of the uh, fate of the Russian Revolution. We should be pretty much uh, near the end of the story by now. We have um, traveled over the uh, the terrain of the 20s and the 30s and up into the early phase of World War II. And today I want to talk about the last part of World War II, the time when World War II becomes truly a world war. You'd have to say that between 1939 and 1941, it's not exactly a world war in that uh, world powers, save for the British, are, are involved in the thing. But, um, um, uh, or I, sh I should say world powers, save for the British, are not involved in the war. Um, I'm, here I'm speaking of uh, the United States and um, Russia, not to mention Japan. These are the powers that are capable of uh, having a really worldwide scope um, in the same sense that the British uh, uh, have a scope of their power. So I guess you can't say that um, um, the war that went on between 1939, 1941, before the Nazis attacked the Soviet Union, uh, I guess you can't say that that's not really a, um, that that, I guess you can't say that that's really a world World War. But anyway, we'll talk about that, the period between 1941-45 today, um, um, when the, um, the World War becomes genuinely a war that involves world powers and affects the entire, uh, the entire globe in a way that it never had been affected. Um, you're looking at the um, greatest product of Soviet society, the greatest product of the Russian Revolution, I guess you'd have to say up to this point, the T-34 tank. So this is the greatest technical achievement of Soviet Russia, the greatest technical achievement of the Stalin dictatorship, of the five-year plans, of the big drive in industry, of the collectivization of agriculture, which supported the big drive in industry and all the rest of it. Probably the best tank in, in the war, um, kind of a simple machine, a Volkswagen, you might say, of a tank, not a Mercedes-Benz, uh, but a... Uh, uh, a, um, a simple machine uh, without any uh, genuine radio equipment uh, that's worth speaking of, and a lot of other doodads, a lot of other technical stuff inside the turret, not much by comparison with uh, the most sophisticated German tanks produced in the war, although it does compare quite favorably <laughs> with the American tanks. As a matter of fact, the American tanks no nowhere near as good as this. No tank produced by the United States was anywhere near uh, uh, touched any of the Russian uh, Russian tanks. Uh, so um, the T-34 is quite a wonderful little thing. It's got a lovely sloped armor and it's got a kind of a pucker uh, to the uh, to the gun turret, you know, a big gun on the thing, a 75 millimeter gun on this version of it. It was to eventually have a 85 millimeter gun, a pretty big gun. And it means it could take on a target at about 1500 meters, maybe a little, little bit more. That's a long way. Uh, usually tanks like to get up a little closer than that uh, if they're fighting tank to tank, um, uh, but uh, taking it on at uh, at um, the greatest range possible, there's some advantage in that as um, as well. Um, and so this tank had a lot of little wonderful features. Oh, and I forgot the most important thing. It was a very simple thing and uh, pretty um, easy to maintain. Um, uh, that's an important thing because um, tanks in World War II, generally when you take them from one place to another, uh, about half of them break down. Well, maybe not half, but a large number of them uh, usually break down going from one place to another just because of, you know, automotive things of various sort. Remember, it's a gigantic vehicle being pulled around by a big engine. And so, um, you know, it's got, um, it absolutely eats up gasoline. It's gallons to the mile rather than miles to the gallon. Um, so um, this one had the advantage of being a very um, simple machine e with ease of maintenance and the rest of it. Oh, and I forgot the most important thing. Uh, the Soviets turned them out like hotcakes. So uh, quantity is a very important thing when it comes to tanks. Uh, you can have a, 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 an inferior tank, um, and, but if there are a large number of them up against a couple of superior ones, um, you know, they can get their way. So quantity really... Uh, really counts. Uh, and um, the five-year plans were able to turn out things in, in quantity. So I'm gushing about tanks because I used to be a, a tank officer. So I really, uh, I, <laughs> I really have a, a tremendous interest in, the, in these things. All right. So we're looking at that thing. We're going to talk more about it as we go on. But let's see, before we go on, I should stop and say um, that um, uh, some of you have sent in book reviews. Remember, they're 
not, they're not um, uh, compulsory, they're optional. Uh, but um, if you still are working on a review, still want to get it in, please get it in as soon as you can so uh, I can get it back to you with time for you to contemplate the, um, uh, the comments. Um, uh, please get those in. Um, today I'll talk about World War II, and then from this point on, we will have finished our survey, strictly speaking, of the Russian Revolution uh, on the basis of um, the day-by-day, -day or, uh, well, year-by-year, -year, analysis. And from this point on, I want to um, talk about a few general things. I want to talk about the fate of the Russian Revolution and the Cold War. I want to talk about the Gorbachev reforms and the way they reviewed the history that we've talked about in this course. So these are a couple of things that will occupy us. And of course, we'll be concerned with that because they involve the collapse of the whole revolution enterprise. The whole Soviet Union is going to be partitioned. Uh, communism is going to um, go in the tank. And um, all these things are going to, uh, are, you know, going to pass, um, and, and uh, something that we need to um, need to comment on um, uh, at the end of the course. So those are the things that we'll be talking about. I'll probably talk to you a, a number of times more. We still have two weeks in the uh, course, and I will probably record several more of these lectures, and uh, we'll talk some more about those things about summing up the whole experience of the Russian Revolution as a historian, maybe a historian of international relations or a historian of Russia or a historian or maybe a world historian uh, would uh, would sum them up. All right, so there we are um, uh, looking at the T um, the T34. Oh, and the last thing I guess I forgot to mention is that if there was some Soviet citizen around in 1941 uh, and um, we were talking about the T34, I guess that Soviet citizen would probably um, um, want to stick us with the idea that um, socialism uh, really works. If this is the best tank in the war and the Soviets won the war and the Germans were the best tank army, I guess you can't say that socialism doesn't work. Or at any rate, that Soviet socialism hasn't worked. No, and the Russians like to think of it that way. Even the post-Soviet Russians like to think of it that way, a popular textbook uh, talks about this period, a uh, textbook that it is used in the high schools in, um, uh, in Russia today, talks about this period and says uh, um, this it was a great test uh, that was, uh, that was, uh, that was um, given to the, uh, the, the Russian Revolution and the Soviet people, uh, but it was a test that they passed. Well, I guess they can say that. It's, uh, it, we, certainly, we certainly can't deny that. So uh, let's talk about Operation Barbarossa. Operation Barbarossa, the Nazi attack on the Soviet Union, uh, done in three general directions. I mean, there's, there's a lot more complicated than this. This map doesn't really um, um, describe that complication, but it does get the central idea, which is that there are three big vectors with large armies. They're going to be millions in number. The Germans are going to throw some four million men into this thing before they're finished. So they get a big army group um, going down the Smolensk Road on the way to Moscow. That's in the center. And in the north, go through the Baltic states, head toward Leningrad. In the south, uh, go toward Kiev, presumably run right through the Ukraine, dominate the Ukraine, um, and um, go all the way to the Caucasus and perhaps even seal off some of that oil in the Caucasus for the uh, Nazis. This is the general thrust of their, of their attack. Hitler was very conscious of the fact that he, he, he has um, a, a Napoleonic um, a precedent to consider with all this. Napoleon attacked Russia in 1812, as you know, took Moscow, and was driven back. And Hitler was conscious of being um, going in Napoleon's footsteps. He didn't want to repeat Napoleon's mistake. Uh, he didn't want to race for Moscow. That's the way he interpreted it, at any rate. He said the whole thing would have to be won not with a race right down that main road to Moscow uh, in the center. It would have to be won by a series of vast enveloping actions um, 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 taken um, uh, between this area and uh, between the border and, and Moscow. In fact, that area up to Smolensk, um, in that area, they'd have to sweep around in these big enveloping and circling actions and wipe out the Soviet armed forces. They had a pretty good idea that most of the Soviet armed forces were pushed up front, and they were, 
pushed up against the border, uh, but they had some depth, uh, but the depth didn't go all the way back to Moscow. And he thought that um, he could envelop these forces and wipe them out. And he had a political edge to the strategy as well. He took the view that once you wipe out these forces, and the Russians uh, get wind of this, once this, uh, once this is known to the Russians, uh, that their army uh, is going to collapse that, and that their government is going to cave in, uh, that some military uh, unit will arrest Stalin and that'll be the end of the whole thing. So he was expecting that the Russians would, would cave in, would, cru would be crushed uh, uh, morally and spiritually by these big military defeats that he was going to um, impose um, on, their, on their armed forces, but not race to the Moscow and seize, not race to Moscow and seize the capital as Napoleon did. So that, that's his general strategy. Um, how do the Russians uh, fight back? Well, we're going to be describing it today, but perhaps I can begin by reading you a couple of uh, passages from the testimonials of some of the um, German generals who came up against the Russians, their general impressions of what the Russians would like. They'll, they'll be interesting for us because um, they'll tell us something about, you know, the condition of Russia that the Germans found, how they found this strange, vast land that they had to contend with, um, uh, what they thought of the Russian fighters, how well they fought, what they thought of the Russian equipment, and all the rest of that. So um, here's the testimony of uh, Blumentritt, General Blumentritt, who was the um, who was uh, General Rundstadt's um, operations chief in Poland, and he was under General von Kluge in the center in, um, in uh, the Russian campaign. He says the, uh, the great motor highway leading from the frontier to Moscow was unfinished, an unfinished highway. Uh, the one road uh, that Westerners, it was the one road that the Westerners could really call a road. So the Germans are very unhappy uh, not finding really good roads. Tanks like good roads. Uh, they don't like to be going around in the mud and in dirt tracks. They don't like that at all. Um, it was about the only road that Westerners would really call a road. He said, we, we weren't prepared for what we found because our, our maps in no way corresponded to reality. On those maps, um, um, all main uh, uh, roads were marked in red, and there seemed to be many. Uh, but when we got there, they often proved to be just sandy tracks. So not good roads, not good roads in Russia. Marshal von Kleist, who was um, commander of 1st Panzer Army in Russia in 1941 and two, talk, uh, talked about the Russians. He said, their equipment was good, he said, even in 1941 especially the tanks. Um, their artillery was excellent. And, and also most of the infantry weapons. Uh, the rifles were uh, more modern, he says. More modern than ours. More modern rifles uh, than ours. Um, and they had a more rapid rate of fire. And the T-34 tank, he says, the T-34 tank was the finest in the world. So these are the German generals speaking about that. General von Blumentritt, um, he was, um, um, as we said before, Ronstadt's uh, uh, chief of staff in Poland under von Kluge in Russia. He said, the Red Army of 1941-45 uh, was far harder, he says, than the Tsar's army. As a young man, he had uh, uh, participated in the German campaigns against Russia in World War I. So he's comparing the Tsar's army to the Soviet army. He said, the Red Army of 1941-5 was far harder than the Tsar's army, uh, because they were fanatically fighting for an idea, unlike the case uh, in World War I. And then lastly, the testimony of Manteuffel again. No, I, we haven't quoted Manteuffel. Manteuffel was um, um, a commander with Rommel in, um, in the West in 1940, an attack on France. And um, he had a pincer army, a uh, panzer army in um, in Russia, um, um, von Manteuffel says, um, the advance of a Russian army, he says, is uh, something Westerners can't imagine. Behind the tank spearheads rolls on a vast horde, largely mounted on horses. Soldier carries a sack on his back with dry crusts of bread and raw vegetables. 
um, vegetables collected on the march uh, from fields and, and villages. The horses eat the straw from the house roofs. Um, the Russians are accustomed to carrying on that way for as long as three weeks. Um, you can't really stop them the way you would stop an ordinary army by cutting off their communications. What he means by that, by communications, is their long trains of supplies on the roads. You can't cut off their communications because you rarely find any columns uh, to strike. It's a, an army almost without supply trains. That's a kind of an interesting, interesting statement. That can't be literal because uh, we know that uh, tanks have to have gas. If they don't have gas, no more. It's hopeless. It's hopeless. Uh, a tank without gas, it, they rather, they'd rather be without uh, ammunition and guns, as a matter of fact, than to be without tanks, uh, be without uh, gas. Um, so um, there have to be gas tankers coming up behind the tanks everywhere. There has to be a column of gas tankers um, to attack. But uh, his general point, I think, this vast column of supplies that might follow a Western army, uh, the Germans, and a number of German generals say this, they don't really see this in quite the same way. This is an army that is quite primitive. Once you get past the tank spearheads, it's quite primitive. It's an interesting thought that uh, we ought to contemplate how, how to interpret this then. I would say, uh, you know, it seems to see, it seems to argue that Russia under the five-year plans is a, a country with a very, very modern face, a country that is capable of doing great, great things, but still a very backward country, and that behind this modernity you find uh, a backward country. You know, the, the way Lenin used to put it, uh, we're dragging our old peasant nag, or we're hauling our old peasant cart behind us. Still a backward country uh, by comparison with the European countries, and certainly backward by comparison with Germany. Nevertheless, up front it has a shield. These tank spearheads are a genuine, are a genuine thing. All right, so enough of that. Um, the impressions of the German generals about the Russian army, uh, quite interesting. Well, the Russians um, then are contending with these big tank envelopments and all this fighting going on um, in the first thousand kilometers uh, into Russia that the, uh, that the Germans are penetrating. When uh, Roosevelt sent to Russia his um, uh, closest and most um, trusted aide, Harry Hopkins. Harry Hopkins um, had a, an apartment right in the White House uh, so he could be closer to Roosevelt. Uh, and he is uh, certainly the, uh, the most trusted figure among all of the advisors of Roosevelt, a general troubleshooter, uh, and not a specialist in particular, uh, but a general general troubleshooter sent to Russia to talk to Stalin. And first thing he said to Russia, how are things going? Can you hang on? <laughs> and uh, Stalin told him, of course, give us some aviation fuel and a few other things, and we can probably fight on for three or four years. Hmm. Probably fight on for three or four years. Um, so that's, that's encouraging. A lot of the American generals have been taking the view that uh, Russia is going to collapse right away. Uh, there's no real military expertise behind any of these opinions tossed out willy-nilly by American generals. And there's quite a bit of it at this time. No real reason for them to shoot their faces off about this topic. They couldn't possibly have any genuine understanding. We did not have good information about Russia. We didn't even have decent, um, uh, decent maps of the country. Um, so uh, no reason for them to have any real authority in speaking about it, something like that. But somebody's always going to ask them for their opinion. They thought Russia would collapse. But uh, Stalin was very confident and impressed Harry Hopkins quite a good deal. And Hopkins also came away repeating something interesting that Stalin told him about Germany. He said he really... He, Stalin, told Hopkins, he really was surprised about this German attack. He had not expected it, he said. He did not, he told Hopkins, did not consider that this attack was the product of German bourgeois society as a whole, of the German ruling class, or of the German military leadership. He did not think 
that uh, this attack was not uh, something that they would have wanted to do. He said, the reason for the attack, he said, was the swift and murderous passion of one man. That's the way he put it to Hopkins. At any rate, that's the way Hopkins repeated it to Roosevelt. The swift, murderous passion of one man, Adolf Hitler. Interesting way to put it. Um, also, interesting thing for Stalin to say as a communist and a Marxist, uh, analyzing German society. Maybe they've been trying to overthrow German society for a couple of decades now. Uh, subjecting it to their penetrating analysis. According to his analysis, Germany doesn't want this fight. There's only one man, Adolf Hitler, wants this fight. It's an interesting take on the thing. You can even ask yourself if it's a genuine Marxism that we're hearing, hearing with Stalin. Well, at any rate, uh, this was encouraging news for uh, Roosevelt. And uh, some others are encouraged. Uh, Partridge, you know, for, for Punch, uh, gives an indication of encouragement here. Here, uh, here he has Hitler plunging into the Ukraine and um, realizing he's on a greasy pole and the bear is, uh, the bear's got him pretty much uh, where the bear wants him. So um, it's kind of the opposite view of what some of the American generals were saying and uh, reflected by uh, Partridge and Punch. As for Roosevelt, um, Roosevelt takes the view that um, he's going to support um, the Russian Revolution, going to support Stalin right from the first day. So Roosevelt and Churchill had talked about this, and the minute they got the news, June 22nd, 1941, um, they declared that they were going to be backing up Stalin. They were on Stalin's side. Churchill said, of course, I've said a lot of things about Russia and done a lot of things about, remember, he's probably the most inveterate enemy of Russia in the uh, English ruling circles. And of course, a demiurge of the Civil War, you remember, back uh, uh, just after the revolution. Um, but he, Churchill, says that um, he's uh, not going to take a word back uh, from anything he said about Soviet Russia. Uh, but uh, it all seems as nothing now. It all seems as nothing now before the great drama that's opening up and the great, of course, the great possibility opened up um, to Britain and to the United States by the German attack on Russia. They're going to plunge in Churchill and Roosevelt as one on the same day, really. They gave radio addresses on the same day. Um, and, indicating the support of their two countries for Soviet Russia. So there it is. It looks possible now that World War II against Hitler is going to be won. At any rate, uh, that's what Churchill and Roosevelt were pretty much thinking as one at this point. Well, Roosevelt's conception is, though, um, the United States is not going to plunge into this thing. Remember, the United States is not in the war. So uh, the United States, when it pledges support, just means that it's going to be giving lend-lease um, uh, to the Soviets. Well, that was already voted in Congress in the summer of 1941. Lend-lease dates from March 1941. It's going to go to the British, and it's a lovely way of giving the British what the British can't pay for. And that was exactly the way um, uh, Churchill put it to Roosevelt. And Roosevelt had a very homely way of describing this. When your neighbor's house is on fire and he wants to use your garden hose to put the fire out. You don't haggle with him about the terms of it. You just give him the hose, and uh, you expect him to give it back to you when the thing is all taken care of. Um, so uh, we're just going to give money. We're just going to pass. It's going to be billions of dollars now uh, in trade credits, and we're going to be supplying uh, England from this point on. It's March of 1941. When um, Roosevelt argued this. And then um, Soviets were included in this thing um, in the summer of 1941. Remember, the United States is not in the war. So this is quite a thing that Roosevelt is managing to talk the American public into. But the United States has an interest in this thing in supplying and supporting and really taking up an essentially warlike position without declaring war, without actually being in the war. Um, uh, uh, take a warlike position vis-a-vis -vis Soviet Russia and, and to help help the uh, first the British and then actually the Soviets um, 
all that committed um, uh, before the United States comes into the war. So that's his strategy. It's going to be Lend-Lease. And um, similarly, uh, the United States help, has to help the British in the Atlantic, has to help the British uh, uh, against the German submarines in the Atlantic, has to keep open supply lines uh, that are taking supplies from the United States to England. And then what goes with that has to use aircraft and destroyers um, to track some of this submarine traffic and to report on it uh, to British units at sea and to give them all sorts of information and help um, uh, to help sink these submarines. So the United States really taking quite a warlike position uh, in the mid-Atlantic. And every once in a while, and about four or five incidents here, which we can't go through at length, but every once in a while, some American unit or some American tanker or whatever is sunk uh, by a submarine. It gives the opportunity for the United States to declare war on Germany, which the United States is not going to do. Um, and, uh, Rosa, and also gives the opportunity for Roosevelt to call them names, you know, rattlesnakes of the Atlantic and to say he's going to shoot on sight and say all these kinds of things. Uh, Roosevelt inching his way into this war pretty much the way the United States got into World War I. Roosevelt was Secretary of the Navy then, and the United States got into World War I um, ostensibly in an um, assertion of neutral rights at sea, so uh, against unrestricted submarine warfare. So this is going to be kind of similar, and, and um, and Hitler could see this. Hitler could see Roosevelt inching his way towards it. It was not going to give him the opportunity. Um, every time something like that happened, Hitler backed off and, and um, did not provoke the United States and wanted to keep it at bay at least for a while. Uh, would have liked to have seen it occupied somewhere else than the Atlantic, maybe in the Pacific. So Roosevelt in this uh, slide is pointing to the Pacific and uh, perhaps indicating um, his other great line toward the Soviet Union, the Pacific, uh, talking about the fact that uh, now that the Nazis have attacked Russia, that Japan uh, might attack Russia too. Once again, this is a repetition of the general geopolitical um, visage of, um, of the Allied intervention with Japan attack attacking in Siberia. And remember, the Japanese have been fighting the Russians every summer, <laughs> 37, 38, 39, I said, well, here we are in 41, maybe they'll attack right into Siberia and repeat what they did um, in the Allied intervention, um, start taking some of those stations along the Trans-Siberian rail line in the uh, Soviet, Soviet Far East. The Russians, of course, with worrying about the Germans, uh, you know, would not be able to do as much as they'd like um, um, uh, to help, um, except for the fact that the Soviets have a non-aggression pact with Japan which they also managed to get in April of 1941. The Japanese would have to drop this pact. But of course, the Nazis had a pact with Soviet Russia, so the Japanese might do exactly the same thing the Nazis have done, pact or no pact, here we come. Um, and that's what Roosevelt is primarily worried about, I think you'd have to say. Hmm, should I say that, primarily? Yes, I think even primarily. Out of the Atlantic, very important. But I think Roosevelt felt he could soft pedal it in the Atlantic and um, carry on this help for England without actually being drawn into war. You can practically measure it if you're Roosevelt. And um, at the same time, um, put as much pressure on Japan as possible. Remember, the United States is not at war with Japan. And put as much pressure on Japan as possible to keep the Japanese from attacking Russia. So Roosevelt said this a number of times, articulated it very sharply. We have to keep the Japanese away from Russia. We have to threaten them in various ways. Um, but we've got to back off those threats because we don't want that to develop into war. This is Roosevelt's very careful, how shall I put it, feline, Machiavellian uh, uh, kind of policy. Very, very subtle. Uh, military strategy that he is pursuing, military and, and diplomatic strategy. And moreover, use diplomacy to dangle a possible understanding in front of the Japanese. Uh, talk about a modus vivendi, 
but between Japan, use that term, modus vivendi between Japan, a way of living between Japan and the United States that might be worked out if the we can figure out a way to get the Japanese to do various, and of course, when they get down to specifics, it's always get out of Manchuria, <laughs> renounce everything you've done since 1931. But remember, the Japanese are sprawled out along the China coast now, and they're fighting their way inland uh, over a vast stretch of territory in China. Um, and uh, Roosevelt, uh, he puts these demands to them. So, you know, it's obvious this thing's going to go nowhere. Uh, this whole question of the diplomacy thing, but it's enough to delay, as, uh, as uh, Roosevelt said uh, to Churchill, to baby them. I want to baby them along and, um, and keep them away from Russia, keep them worried about it. And finally, the last thing he did in July of 41, Roosevelt cut off the, uh, the access to American gas, American petroleum. So oddly enough, strangely enough, Japanese were dependent on American petroleum, which they were buying in the United States and bringing and bringing across the Pacific in tankers. Dependent on that for their um, uh, for the fueling of their war machine in Asia. So the United States is a position. Sometimes I refer to it in terms of the you know these little dog collars you put on a uh, put on a dog, uh, and <laughs> you get, they're sort of like a what the uh, the fishermen call a star drag. Uh, on their reel, you know, the reel all the way out, the dog runs all the way out. Then you put your thumb on the thing and suddenly the chain snaps and catches the dog by the neck. The United States had the Japanese, I think, in something like that position with regard to petroleum supplies. Um, but he cut them off completely in July of 1941. So what did that mean? Japanese would have to like start to look for their oil in a hurry. Where are they going to look? They have to go south into into the Dutch Indies, today's Indonesia. That's where they can get the oil. That's really the only place they can get the oil. It's now desperate since they can't get any more from the United States. And they're on the clock now because they've got to make war in order to get this oil. On the other hand, they can't head toward Russia. There's no oil in Siberia. So joining the Siberian camp campaign to help the Nazis out which maybe the Jap Japanese might have contemplated, that's really less, less likely at this point now. They've got to go on this hunt for oil. And all that was manipulated. I guess that's the right way to put it. Manipulated by Roosevelt. So he is a, uh, how to put it, a strategic friend, a very vital strategic friend of the Russians here, acting in such a way that the Japanese will have to head south instead of heading north into Siberia to help in the campaign against Russia. Now, what does that mean? It means that the Japanese are going to be attacking in the south, and they're going to go in the direction of American interests, um, of course, in the Philippines. Um, and when that happens, of course, the United States will be pulled. There's no getting around it. They will be pulled into a fight. I suppose, though, the Japanese attack the South, grab the oil, and don't attack, bypass the Philippines. What will Roosevelt do? He didn't have a good answer to this. In fact, Churchill asked him this uh, very directly, and uh, Roosevelt couldn't give him a good answer. He said something vague about, we'll all be in this together. Uh, but he didn't have a good answer. Why? Because he'd have to go before Congress and say, oh, look, we have to fight um, in, uh, against uh, the Japanese in order to defend the colonial possessions of the British, the Dutch, and the French in Asia. Hmm. Not much of an argument to make before an American Congress. There's a dilemma Roosevelt's in, but he's doing his best. And I think the number one thing on his mind, really, it's not, I'm not, issuing a, a cranky and odd opinion here. This is more or less consensus by the best historians on this. But uh, that Roosevelt's, the main thing on Roosevelt's mind here is to help Russia by keeping the Japanese from attacking in the, uh, in the Far East. And then, of course, giving the lend -Lease lots of supplies going to, um, going to Russia and going to, and going to Japan. Um, so the main thing then is this Nazi plunge down the Smolensk Road 
you know, Roosevelt describes the whole thing. This Russian plunge down the Smolensk Road, or I should say the Nazi uh, uh, attack down the Smolensk Road on the way to uh, Moscow. I got a better map of it than that? No. Uh, and these enveloping moves, how do they go? Brilliantly at first, they bag hundreds of thousands of Russian troops in Western, the Western Soviet Union on the border. Well, people say in terms of strategy, the Russians shouldn't have pushed all their troops right up to the border. Everybody has got to use their troops to defend their borders. They cannot allow somebody, they cannot say we're going to let a person have two or three hundred kilometers of our soil before we start to fight them. It's just, I don't know, it's just, it's not thinkable uh, to do that. You have to, any country has to defend its borders. Soviets had to have their troops up on the borders. Not all of them, but, you know, they had to have substantial forces up on the borders. They had plenty of reserves, to be sure. But um, uh, these reserves were being, in front of Moscow, were being enveloped by the Nazi force. But sometimes they get these big bags of hundreds of thousands of prisoners. They were going to take uh, several million, I think it's five million, I have the figure here, five, five million prisoners, five million Soviet prisoners, in the course of this war. Um, so they get a lot of them, and they do really well with these big enveloping movements in the first couple of months, first, I should say the first few weeks of the, uh, of the campaign. Uh, but uh, the envelopments don't always work. Uh, uh, so brilliantly. Sometimes they get the envelopment, they've got the Soviet forces completely surrounded, but the Soviet forces figure out a way uh, to fight their way out. Or they lose a lot of people, they lose a lot of forces, a lot of prisoners are lost, etc. but a remnant of the enveloped forces, of the surrounded forces, manage to fight, manages to fight its way free. And um, so the Soviets continue the fight, and they're foiled. Nazis are foiled. Every time they do this, they're wrecking uh, the Nazi plans. The Nazi plans are for them to collapse, uh, for these big bagging of forces to be the end of the regime. And uh, it, does not, it does not result. It's not resulting. Stalin, of course, said, rearranging all the leadership of the armed forces, you know, doing his best to, to make counter moves, counter offensives, counter envelopments, um, and of course not doing well, losing lots of people. So the terrible attrition. In this first part of the campaign where the Nazis drive to the line that you see on this map, which is the furthest line of their penetration, which they reached, well, not in the south, but their penetration in the center, which they reached in um, 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 September 1941, <coughs> Uh, along this line of, uh, of, of penetration, um, the Soviet um, um, uh, forces um, have waged a, a very considerable uh, war and, and uh, war of counter uh, counter offensives. Um, and uh, by the um, uh, by the end of the summer, uh, by September of um, 1941, uh, the German forces are getting into the environs. Well, not into Moscow, but getting uh, very, very close. At one point, uh, they're really in the suburbs of Moscow. Not in the south, though. Uh, it's not a question of just rushing Moscow. You have to go around it and circle it. The idea of the German attack is to penetrate many, many kilometers to the rear in Moscow and encircle it before they make an attack on the capital. And that's where they fail, especially in the south, especially with Heinz Guderian, the great tank general, at a little town called Tula, just barely south of Moscow a big arms manufacturing town. Uh, he got there at the end of the summer and about the moment when it started to rain. And um, beginning of the fall, the rain starts to get more, gets more intense. These are not good roads, bear in mind. So when it rains, they turn into muddy tracks. Tanks hate mud. And uh, worse than the tanks, the, all the trains, that is to say the supplies behind the tanks, and trucks and all the rest of it, they have to go through the mud too. So that's, the mud is absolute murder and is bogging them down something fierce. So that's a big factor in slowing the, uh, slowing the advance down for the Battle of, Battle of Moscow. Other factors, the Russians are gearing up for a fight to the death. 
That's exactly their mood. And Stalin makes a big speech in Red Square. Let the manly ancestors of uh, the great Russian past, Dmitry Pozharsky, Kuzma Minin, um, all the great Russians, uh, uh, Alexander Nevsky, all the great Russians, uh, uh, and, and Lenin, of course, <laughs> remember all these people, uh, how they, the way they fought to defend the motherland. Uh, we've got to, uh, we've got to defend the motherland, uh, not an inch back. Um, so the citizens of the city are ready to come out and, and fight. We've got a garrison. There are going to be some um, um, Asian troops that are going to be released, that will be able to get into the fray, released by this peace treaty with Japan, um, that they're going to be able to get into the fray. And uh, they'll be in, in the, the last stages of the Battle of Moscow. But here's a poster now describing the resolution of the Soviet citizenry before the Nazi attack. Uh, we will defend. We will defend the motherland, Moscow. Uh, here's another. We make our stand. We make our stand here in Moscow. And then the, the uh, tank traps, you know, and all the boulevards so they can't get, can't, the German tanks can't advance into the city. And then putting tank traps out in front of the town. Often they have to tear up the rails, tear up the uh, rail cars, tramvies, uh, and put these uh, um, uh, rails onto trucks, women driving these trucks out to the end of town to uh, erect these tank traps um, uh, so they can put obstacles and obstacles in front of the German, uh, the German tank. This is a really elemental struggle uh, going on in Moscow, and there are going to be tremendous losses in this thing. Moscow, the uh, Germans probably lost um, about a third of them, 300,000 or so deaths in the course of this battle from Moscow, and the Soviets probably lost twice that. Uh, closer to 600,000. Uh, this according to uh, military historians that have studied this thing. So the Battle of Moscow, elemental struggle where the Russians are going to try to hold. And by guard they do. By December 7th, the German forces realize that they're not going to be able to penetrate all these defenses. that the winter, which had come suddenly, Guderian's praying uh, for a freeze, praying for the cold weather, uh, because the mud is too much. He wants the mud to freeze so the tanks can get loose. And he got it suddenly in the first week of December. Um, but the, the winter came on, the, and the weather was, uh, had a drop of about 40 degrees. So, so you have sub-zero temperatures now, suddenly, that the Germans are contending with, you know, although they can get their tanks moving. Uh, all that was very t tough for the Germans, who had expected this thing to be over by now. They wanted a quick campaign, and they weren't really equipped properly uh, for the winter. Um, and within a few days of this tremendous turn in the weather, the Germans actually made the decision to give up the battle and uh, to slow it down till the weather got better. And that's going to be months uh, from, from this point. So the Battle of Moscow, in effect, was won in the first week of December 1941. And the first week of December 1941, of course, is well known to us because of December 7th, the day, as Roosevelt said, that will live in infamy, Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. So that's two big pieces of news in one week, December 7th, and the first week of December 1941. The first defeat of the Nazi forces in Russia, which maybe gives an indication they're not going to win there. At any rate, not going to win so easily. Uh, and that's the first indication that this great machine can be stopped. And the Japanese, um, so giddy, not, not every Japanese historian uh, admits this, but you can see it from other sources, especially from the reports of the American ambassador, Joseph Brew, in Japan. Yeah, the Japanese military people and the Japanese press, they're so giddy about the Germans uh, defeating Russia. The Germans defeat Russia. Their ally, uh, uh, you know, the Germans, 
defeat Russia. The Japanese will really have their way. Uh, there will be no problems. In fact, they might even say, let's get this oil in, of, the, of the Indies. Let's get it in a hurry. Let's destroy the American fleet. Uh, not with the idea of waging war with the Americans for five years. Heavens no. It's just that once we destroy the uh, striking power of the American fleet, you know, for six months or so, and uh, the German state, Moscow, that'll be too much for the Americans, knowing that Eurasia is essentially going to fall into the hands of the Axis. Is that too strong? I don't think so. If the Germans took Moscow, Eurasia would fall, I'm not saying it would fall in a week, but it would fall into the hands of the Germans and the Japanese together. So this attack on Pearl Harbor is not taken as an act of fatality, you know, in the sense of, uh, of fatalism, uh, the way some historians make it out. Even Japanese historians sometimes say this. No, not fatalism, but uh, giddy expectation that the, uh, that the Russians are going to be defeated by the Nazis. And uh, we have to ask ourselves, did this expectation of the Japanese make sense? And I would argue it does make sense. It does make sense. They had the notion, the Japanese did, that they'd attack Pearl Harbor, destroy most of the American fleet, Russians would take Moscow. There it all would be. Wait a few months for this to sink in, so the Americans understand what had happened, and then sue for peace, ask the Americans if they wanted to quit. The Americans would have to say, at this point, can we take on the whole world? Which is what they would be doing, basically. Can we take on the whole world? Or do we have to sue for peace? Do we have to make peace? Well, uh, a Japanese describing this giddy policy would certainly say that, at any rate, shows that the Americans are not going to do any fighting, not ever going to do any fighting. So they might as well make peace. And that's the expectation they have. So when you ask the question, what was more important, Pearl Harbor getting the United States into the war, or Moscow beginning the process of knocking the Germans out of the war, of defeating the Germans, although it's going to take a lot more to do that, I think you'd have to say Moscow was more important. If, um, if the Germans take Moscow, it's entirely possible they win the war. Um, but they didn't. Um, so now the United States is in the war and Churchill is no longer isolated. Remember, Churchill is doing nothing but bombing at this point. That's about all the British can do. They have the Russians from, from June of 41. They have Pearl Harbor. Now Churchill says his memoirs, he said, I now start to contemplate the possibility of actually winning this thing. I went to bed, I sleep the sleep of the saved and, the, uh, and, the, and of the grateful and the saved. I, I sleep the sleep of the grateful and the saved. Oh, and he said something else when he realized there was now a grand alliance between the United States, England, and the Soviet Union. Uh, someone asked him in a cabinet meeting, how are you going to handle the Americans? They haven't been so easy to handle up to this point. And Churchill came back, he said, well, you know, we talked to them one way when they were, when we were wooing them. But uh, now that they're in the harem, Oh, we'll talk to them differently. In the harem, the United States is in the harem now of the British in World War II. It's actually not wrong. The United States is pretty much going to be following Churchill's strategy, at least for a while. It'll do this up till 1943, but then no. Then you're going to see a genuine U.S. strategy, and Churchill is going to take a back seat. But not now. For now, uh, Churchill's going to call the shots, and Roosevelt is going to be, is going to be in the harem. 
Um, so Churchill came to talk to Roosevelt uh, right after Pearl Harbor. And then um, in the spring of 42, uh, Stalin sent Molotov to talk to Roosevelt. And um, Molotov presents, of course, the Soviet demand, which you're going to see, you know, Soviets repeating every day from this point on, uh, we want a second front. We want somebody to fight the Russians on the other side, draw some of their forces off so we'd have to take on the whole German army. Never going to exactly get it the way they want it. Um, but uh, when Molotov presented that to Roosevelt, Roosevelt said, yes, it ought to be possible for us to do something in 1942. I said this in the spring of 1942, talking with Molotov. Well, we'll have a second front. Maybe we'll have a second front this year. Molotov came back, reported this to Stalin. Um, Stalin was very excited by it at first. Well, we think he was excited by it at first. At any rate, the Soviet press was very excited by it, the idea of a second front in 1942. That's not the way it was going to go. Um, now, there's an argument about this. And it was presented by uh, someone who taught the course to me when I was in your position. And um, this really simple way of putting it was uh, the Americans wanted to attack right away in France, across the Atlantic Ocean, and um, fight the way they fought the Civil War, big frontal assaults, all the rest of that, take the Germans on where they were strongest and beat them up. And um, this is the American position, but the British position was, no, we've got to lay off and pursue a per peripheral strategy in the Mediterranean and in the area around the World Island, maybe in the Pacific, a peripheral strategy uh, for a while. Now, this was the big difference of opinion between the two countries. Uh, that's only slightly right. Um, the fact of the matter is that the American military, here they are represented by General George C. Marshall, the great uh, chief of staff and uh, statesman, leader, diplomat, warrior, great, great American figure. Uh, that was pretty much his position. He wanted to get into the fight as soon as possible and start taking on the Germans. Uh, and land in France, land someplace where you could take on the bulk of the German forces and start destroying them. Uh, not that he wanted to march infantry up against them in World War I style. Every time the Americans talk about taking somebody on in their main strength, you know that the Air Force is going to be in the forefront of all this. So Marshall was thinking in terms of subjecting them to considerable air attack, but also grand, uh, uh, ground attack as well. Uh, but at any rate, right away and across the Atlantic, right into France. Um, that was the Army's position, you have to say. That's not Roosevelt's position. It's wrong to say that that was Roosevelt's position. What was Roosevelt's position? It was Churchill's position to lay off. You have to, in effect, support the roots of the British Empire through the Atlantic, the short route to India. And we have to um, make it impossible for the Germans and the Japanese to link up in the Indian Ocean, of all things. Well, that is something the United States can help, can help to do with its big Navy. And um, this is the other figure that doesn't always get considered in discussing this, Admiral King, um, for the uh, American Navy and very close advisor to Roosevelt, and I think the person um, who Roosevelt depended on. And uh, King was a slippery character in a lot of ways. Um, in this discussion that went on between the American chiefs of staff, the British chiefs of staff, the way it would usually go is the American chiefs would say, oh, we've got to attack in Europe. We've got to, uh, you know, hit them in France, right, where the bulk of the Nazi strength is. And then the British would produce all these papers uh, studying the thing, you know, detail. Brilliant staff work, experienced people. Um, and the Americans would be dumbfounded. It wouldn't be, how to put it, they'd be outclassed in a way in terms of their staff work uh, before the British. They'd be embarrassed about it. And the British would, of course, embarrass them plenty. 
about it. Talk about the inadequacy of the American forces, the difficulty of getting across the Atlantic, the Battle of the Atlantic, the submarines, uh, the landing craft, um, the where do you land, blah, 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 blah. And the British knew all, all about all these things to a much greater degree uh, than the United States. And much more genuine experience um, with these kind of big operations and thinking in this way. American generals kind of, seem to be almost bumpkins by comparison. They come away embarrassed by this discussion. Of course, it, British, absolutely resolute. They're not going to attack on the continent. It's not a question of when. It's not a question of the landing craft. It's not a question of any of that stuff. The British were resolute. Churchill would have, would have been content to stand there for 10 years and bomb. Um, he did not want to land any forces on the continent. And politically, that is a position which is consonant with the optimum defense of the British Empire, with the British national interest, not with the US point of view on it, but with the national interests of the British Empire. All right, so that's the uh, position and the clash between the, the staffs and the American um, generals would come away bruised from this uh, debate with the British and, uh, and King would tell them, oh, these limeys, they don't ever want to attack. They all they want to do is defend the British Empire. Uh, they're not in this thing the way you think. Uh, let's build up our forces in the Pacific instead. He would always offer the Pacific. And as it turned out, King pretty much got his way through the war. Uh, the Pacific got more forces uh, than you might have thought. And it actually was about equal. They built up forces in the Pacific and in preparations for the Atlantic, fighting across the Atlantic at about the same pace. So, uh, and they were even fighting in the Pacific as well. Uh, and they had a Germany first conception from the outset, but fighting in Guadalcanal and the Solomon Islands, defending, of course, Australia and New Zealand and all, all this is King's thinking. Uh, and of course, you can also, there's a little subtext to it that this is going to be an American sphere of influence. Americans are going to have a lot of bases in the Pacific, going to be powerful after the war, it's a, you know, American national interest, you might say, uh, as an expansion of power, maybe an imperial power, you might even say. I don't know. I don't use that word for America, but maybe some would say, some would put it that way. Um, so King's strategy, I think, was Roosevelt's strategy. King made it out that he was opposed to Churchill and only did this to compensate, but actually the two of them ended up working pretty well together in this odd sort of indirect, indirect way. And that's going to be the perspectives of the Americans. So what follows from that? Well, instead of a attack on Western Europe, oh, well, let's attack in, hmm, well, let's say Morocco. <laughs> Morocco. I wonder if any, if any military man would have said, oh, we're going to get ready to attack in Morocco, where, whether we would have said that uh, when the United States first came into the war. But in matter, as a matter of fact, the British are fighting to defend Egypt from the Italians and from Rommel and the Africa Corps. Well, and they're going eventually going to get the upper hand over them in Egypt. And so this is a place where the United States can join in. And it's sort of in keeping with the fighting, the perspectives of the fighting in, um, in the Pacific at a place like Guadalcanal, way down at the edge of the Japanese power projection. You know, hit them where they're least likely to be able to uh, get a lot of forces to, to fight back. And, you know, the Nazis are not going to be able to do much about Morocco. Mussolini not going to be able to do much about Morocco. Uh, Vichy France actually controls it. Uh, but the United States recognized Vichy. <laughs> that was a diplomatic stratagem of Roosevelt's. Sometimes he's so, he's so smart he's too smart almost uh, but at any rate um, the united states took the view that uh, they're you know uh, since they recognize vichy recognizes them they probably won't get big forces to oppose them they didn't come they weren't completely unopposed but they weren't very much opposed either and they landed there in november 1942 so the americans are coming here they come and um, they sent some forces through gibraltar uh, to land at oran and other places on the algerian coast and they take up this Ta uh, this um, this uh, struggle. They take up this march uh, across the uh, the Maghreb 
on the way to Tunisia, and they're going to have a big bite, f fight with the retreating uh, forces of Rommel and the Germans at a place called Kasserin Pass, where they don't do so well, and uh, gives them weight to the legend the Americans can't fight too well, they haven't got too much experience, better listen to the British on this. The British are against any kind of general attack uh, uh, on the coast. Now, that is to say the British are against a general front, so uh, a second front. Well, this is the kind of thing uh, that Stalin uh, is bound to be very unhappy about. And de Gaulle for the French, and you see him here in the picture standing behind uh, Molotov. This is actually a picture from 1944, uh, but de Gaulle was in good contact with uh, Stalin and the Russians through this period. Uh, he represents the Free French, and de Gaulle is telling Stalin through his representatives um, that um, the Americans and the British are never going to give you their second front. They're never going to get into the fight. They're going to let you bleed and die. The only people who have an interest in this thing, that is to say, who are on the continent, are the French. And we want a second front. So we're the only ones among the Allies who are for a second front, which you, Mr. Stalin, which you want. So there's this intimacy between de Gaulle and Stalin. And as a kind of reward for that uh, perspective on the matter, uh, Stalin encouraged all the uh, uh, resistance people, and they're all nearly all communists, the resistance fighters in France. Um, uh, he encouraged them to support de Gaulle. And really, if, if de Gaulle had not had them on his side, it's um, you have to wonder if de Gaulle actually could have uh, put himself forward as the leader of the French. So he, re he really depends on Stalin for his power. And of course, he, he's a steadfast ally of the Soviets at this point, more, more steadfast, he thinks, and says, uh, than the, uh, British, and the uh, British and the Americans. Hmm. So there, there's an interesting uh, discussion going on. Meanwhile, the Soviets are trying to grind on and fight, fight their way westward. So as you see in this map, they've managed to save themselves around Moscow. See if I can get my pointer happening in here. Pointer options. Uh, let's try the pen. So here they are around Moscow. Soviets making a big defense around Moscow. Then they come down to this, take on the second part of the battle. So after the defeat at Moscow, the Nazis are going to swing to the south. Instead of continuing the fight in 42, they race to the south, down between these river valleys, into much better weather, of course, <laughs> in order to race for the Caucasus and get hold of that Soviet oil. And look at the penetration they make in the south. So Hitler was buoyed up, and actually he thought that he was not going to suffer Napoleon's fate. In fact, he thought he had defied uh, Napoleon's fate succeeded where Napoleon ha had failed. Um, and he plunges into the south, but has to come to this junction, the Volga River, and has to take on the second big battle. Third one, before I abandon this lovely little pen, the third one is around Minsk, uh, excuse me, Kursk. So these are the three big battles of World War II for the Soviets. Moscow at the end of 41, Stalingrad at the end of 42, Kursk in July 1943. Three big battles, all defensive battles. All big defensive battles. We're going to do plenty of offensive operations, but the big battles where they took on and annihilated large numbers of German forces, those are these, these three. And uh, Stalingrad is a place that actually is a bad place to defend because it's got its back up to an obstacle. At, in military at West Point, you probably tell everybody you never try to defend anything with your back up against an obstacle. Um, and there's the river, and there's the, that's the way the town is situated, vis-a-vis -vis the river. And so the Germans are going to be attacking from the west against Stalingrad. And the battle actually goes on right in the city, inside the city of Stalingrad. So, colossal 
elemental battle, the, the most elemental battle we know about in modern history up, up to this time. Maybe two million deaths, two million deaths on both sides in this battle. And both sides losing about equally. Um, and the Russians fighting house to house, sometimes room to room in a department store. Somebody's over by the perfume counter shooting at somebody down there in menswear. <laughs> They're fighting all over the town, everywhere. Ghastly, elemental, basic, crude struggle. Great fighting on the part of the Russians that the Nazis never dreamed that they'd be capable of. And it ends with a huge envelopment of the Nazi forces in the hundreds of thousands, maybe 300,000. Uh, and uh, finally, the surrender of their commander, von Paulus, with 24 of his leading general rank um, officers. An ordinary Soviet soldier had Paulus at first and was looking him up and down. Are you really a German general, as you say? Yes, so they got him. The magnificent victory, the greatest victory of World War of World War II, uh, no getting, no getting around it. And a great, great tribute, as all the Russian propaganda apparatus indicates, to the great Russian people, um, fighting for Mother Russia. That's the way they put it here. here there's Mother Russia, Mother Russia wrapped in the red flag. All these resolute fighters in the first rank. And here another poster with the T-34s roaring in the background. It's Russian soldiers saying, for the motherland, uh, for Stalin, for Stalin. And uh, with this poster, once again, with the T-34s rolling in the background, Stalin saying, uh, or the poster says at any rate, Stalin leads us to victory. It was a great, great victory on the part of the Soviets. So um, the Americans have had their little campaign uh, in Morocco and ended up in Tunisia. They've chased uh, the Germans out of Africa. Well, that's something. Um, they report, you can report that to Stalin and Stalin say, when are you going to start fighting? You'll find that you, it's not too tough once you get started fighting. That's the way Stalin talks, uh, talks to Churchill. Well, you can't talk that way to Churchill, really. Churchill will say, wait a minute. I was in this war in 1939, uh, and the Germans were bombing us and attacking us with enthusiasm, and you were supporting them at the time. So come on. Uh, you can't say that to me. OK, OK, Stalin would back off uh, before that. Say, oh, well, this campaign might contribute in some way. It'll help to be, it'll encourage the resistance. He said, the fight in North Africa will encourage the resistance, he says, and, uh, and you know, will overawe Spain. Oh, really? But he didn't say it would draw off large numbers of Germans and help the Russians in any way. Had to, Stalin had to be diplomatic about it, but you knew how he felt about it. He was, felt he was being betrayed. Whether that's just or not is something for us to decide, and it's not, uh, not so straightforward um, whether Stalin is his demand for the Second Front was a matter of justice. I don't know. This, this is something we could talk about. At any rate, this is the Casablanca Conference with uh, Roosevelt and Churchill trying to reconcile two uh, French leaders. It's not going to work, <laughs> this reconciliation between Henri Giraud on the left and de Gaulle on the right. Roosevelt can't get up, you know, he's crippled. And uh, Churchill supports him by sitting down next to him. And the two Frenchmen are going to shake hands. Roosevelt is enjoying a good laugh over all, all of that. Uh, but it won't work that way. Um, de Gaulle's not going to put up with Giraud. And very soon, uh, de Gaulle will assert himself and become the real leader of the French. But at any rate, this is the sort of thing they're talking about. Uniting the French. Gee, uniting the French at this point. What's it got to do with Russia? Stalin wants to know. Well, at the end of the conference, Roosevelt decided he had to say something. And he said, look, we're for unconditional surrender. We're going to fight to the end. It's not going to be like World War I. We're not going to 
make a deal before the enemy is defeated, as they did in 1918. They did not defeat Germany at the end. You know, look at the trouble that all that cost. Um, Roosevelt learned from that. Roosevelt did not want to have any secret treaties as they had in World War One, nor a conditional surrender as they had in World War One. Now, lots of people criticize this on abstract grounds. Is it a good idea? It makes the enemy fight all the harder. Oh yes, yes. Uh, but what Roosevelt is talking about here is that he does not want secret arrangements, deals, a separate peace. It, it, Nazism has to be destroyed, especially after this colossal loss of life we're talking about when you consider the Russians um, um, counted into it. Oh, and there's one other thing I shouldn't <laughs> ignore. The, um, the Declaration of Unconditional Surrender is really a substitute for an actual second front because they're not going to have the second front after this African adventure. They're going to do something completely different. And for this, I need some, some kind of a picture. Yes, they're going to attack. Let me get some, some pointer help here. They're going to be attacking in, uh, in Sicily. Hmm. Sicily. I wonder what Stalin thought of that. Couldn't think much. It's not going to draw off a lot of divisions. Maybe all told there were 18 divisions or so in Italy. There were 200 divisions in Russia. So it's not going to be very helpful to the Russians in Sicily. And then after they win in Sicily, they're going to cross and start fighting in southern Italy. It's going to bring down Mussolini. But you know, this is not going to get anywhere, and uh, they're not going to get much farther than Rome before the war is over. And the Americans are going to end up doing a lot of fighting here. And, uh, and that's it. <laughs> what is the point? Well, they're knocking Mussolini out of the war. They're saving their own lives. They're shoring up the British position in the Mediterranean. Mm, that's true. They're not helping Stalin much. But they are doing those things. So at any rate, that was the strategy that was pursued. You can see how unhappy Stalin would be about all of, all of that. And that's the way things are going. And, and it comes down to July 19. 1943 and the big battle for Kursk. So the third big battle. This piece in the bottom is a uh, snapshot, it, so it's not part of the map. It's a snapshot. It doesn't look like it, but and shows Kursk and Oryol, uh, this uh, industrial town just north of Kursk. So there's a big salient, as you can see, a big salient here. Oh, wait a minute, let me get some help. There's a big, sal big salient. Hmm. Um, the Kursk salient. And of course, the Nazis are going to try to attack into the salient. Um, and they decided to have a all-out battle, see if they could crush the Soviet armor by using all of the, their remaining armor. That's basically what they did. So the Nazis threw all their tanks into this thing. And the Soviets threw a lot of tanks into this thing. This is another huge, bloody, nasty tank battle. So up to this time, it's the biggest tank battle in history. Uh, it's going to feature almost every kind of tanks. The Germans had almost every kind of tanks. These are the Panzer IVs that they were throwing in, a very good tank, uh, which they were throwing into the battle in large numbers. And of course, the valiant T-34 thrown into the thing. There's a T-34 that um, got the treatment, was actually knocked out. So uh, a round, no doubt, penetrated into the hull and blew up its ammunition. And that's what happens. It blows the whole turret off. And of course, the people inside, of course, no chance of surviving that. And it got all chewed up. Um, I have a few more other admiring, loving pictures of it of the T-34. 
And you know, if you travel around Russia in the countryside these days, even these days, uh, they're in little towns. Uh, they'll frequently have a monument right in the center of town with a big T-34 tank sitting on it to remind them of the great achievement. Oh, and uh, lastly, I have here just a little footnote. I have here a T-34 sitting next to the, uh, the cream of the German tanks, um, the King Tiger with its 88 gun. This is a marvelous, magnificent animal, uh, this German tank on the right, next to the humble little T-34 <laughs> on, on the left. But if you look at the uh, big animal, you know, it's got these great big tracks and, you know, if you something hits those big tracks, they throw a track and the tank is kaput from this point on. So that's the tracks, big tracks, they're just a big target, basically. And then look at the surfaces on the German vehicle, uh, perpendicular surfaces. So a um, nanny tank round coming in is not going to slide off. It's going to be caught on those perpendicular. Look at the turret even. A lot, of, a lot of perpendicular space there on the turret, uh, which might catch a round, you know, that might otherwise bounce off. Look at the Russian tank. Some of these rounds at any rate might bounce off that turret or might bounce off that hull because of the sloped armor. Well, maybe the little Russian animal is not so bad. After all, the gun is just about as big as 85. You know, right, well, that's a 75, I believe, uh, right next to that um, 88. So um, almost as good. When, no, it is not as good. It's not as good. Uh, but they were only a few, relatively few, King Tigers produced in the war, magnificent things. And, um, and many, many, many T-34s produce as the Soviets mobilized all their forces, even mobilized children, child labor, child war. Uh, I was a little teen, preteen maybe, with a submachine gun, ready to go out and fight with everybody else. I suppose that if I'd looked around enough, I could probably find some little girls with machine guns doing the fight. And old people and grandmas and grandpas, everybody who could fight. Um, so at any rate, the United States is still in the harem, still following Brit the British line that we're going to go around the periphery until um, really after the Battle of Kursk. Russians and Germans lost about an equal amount of, of armor, uh, but the Germans couldn't give battle again after that. The Germans are falling back everywhere. So from this point on, it's going to be and not a really rapid um, Soviet advance. It's going to be picking away at the German forces, but steadily advancing on every front, really almost at will, in, a sm in small ways, but at will. And um, the German fate is absolutely sealed after, after Kursk. I mean, I don't think it was sealed after, long, after Stalingrad, but it's um, definitely sealed after Kursk, at which point Roosevelt started to wonder, or at any rate started to wonder if he should follow Churchill any further. He's getting some passionate letters from the Secretary of War, Stimson, from a uh, favored uh, roving diplomat, um, uh, Joseph Bullitt, um, and um, they're all saying, in effect, and putting it very, very much like this, saying, um, "Gee, we have to get into this thing. Um, the Germans are going to lose the war. Soviets are going to overrun." Europe completely, they'll be down to the Pyrenees. They're going to organize Europe essentially on their own terms. Time for us to get into the war. Even then, when Roosevelt decided that that was the case, and they definitely had to plan, had to force it on Churchill to plan for a war, uh, a, a landing in Normandy. And you could, if you're a Soviet, you're definitely going to interpret this as trying to catch up with the Soviets and vie with them uh, for the occupation of Germany. Try to get in on the thing at the end after the Germans had been beaten, essentially. So I'm sure Stalin would have put it exactly that way. Um, even then, um, Churchill was not keen about it and uh, was tossing out schemes even in 43. 
is tossing out schemes for other kinds of attacks in the Balkans and other places. Some people say, oh, this would be an easy way to get up into Europe and to uh, vie with the Soviets for the control of East Central Europe, but the, the country is not such that it would be easy to do. Um, if you landed down in the Vardar Valley in Greece, <laughs> there aren't good landing places along the Adriatic coast. Um, but if you did land somewhere down there, you know, fighting your way northward <laughs> would not be a picnic. And the Nazis look like they can contest everything. And they were going to contest everything in, in the West, too. So um, these Churchill schemes, I don't know, they made sense from the standpoint of the British Empire, but not from the standpoint of the United States. And finally, um, Marshall's point of view prevails. Roosevelt goes over to that point of view. And they start talking about they've got to have this thing. And that Tehran in 1943 the fall of 1943, the big three get together for the first time. And uh, they for absolutely force it on Churchill. We're going to have a second front. We're going to have an attack in uh, the main theater in, in Europe, in, uh, in France, in northern France, to take on the main uh, Nazi force. Look at this chair they gave to Churchill. Look at that. It's a couple of inches shorter than the other chairs. Churchill looks diminutive. Did they do that by design? Well, politically, Roosevelt and Stalin are speaking with something close to one voice now. And it's a voice that's opposed to Churchill, dragging Churchill along. Churchill can't refuse. But he's being dragged alone. It's not his, uh, not his preference uh, to land in, in France. Look at that picture. That little chair is really, uh, it really makes Churchill out to be, I don't know, the visual part of it <laughs> makes Churchill out to be a lesser commodity than, uh, than the big two, you might say. Churchill himself wrote about this. I, mean, I, I felt the weakness of Britain compared to the advancing power of the Colossus of America. I felt the weakness. In addition to his attitude toward Russia. There's also his attitude as a British Empire hero um, uh, toward Roosevelt, who's not very sympathetic, particularly, to defending British Empire, although he's been doing it. He's been doing it, but he's not sympathetic to British Empire goals. At any rate, he's with Stalin at this point. They certainly are there strategically and, and uh, enjoying a laugh. And in fact, um, these two conferences in Tehran and Yalta at the end of the war Roosevelt will be openly joshing about Churchill with Stalin, and Stalin will be laughing, and etc. They'll, they'll make little jokes about John Bull and this and that. Roosevelt's way of signaling to Stalin uh, that the United States interests and the Russian interests are getting to be closer, and that uh, maybe they're going to get opposition from Churchill in the name of imperial interests, um, all of which is pretty much inevitable. There they are at Yalta. They finally got a, a better chair for Churchill, but it's even at Yalta, it's going to be the same thing. It's going to be Stalin with Roosevelt, and um, Churchill is definitely the third one. Although on the posters, it doesn't look that way at all. It's a united force that's marching together in this great, great victory for humankind, that's exactly the way they are putting it. Not much exaggeration in that, strictly speaking. Um, this great struggle. When the Americans finally land at, um, at Normandy, when the Americans land at Normandy, which is down here, When they land at Normandy, the Russians will be, uh, ah, Minsk is not on this map. I haven't got a proper map to make this point, but Minsk is about here. It's where the Russians are. So look at that. It's about the same distance from Berlin. In fact, you could even say maybe the, maybe the Russians are closer to Berlin than the Americans are by the time the Americans get into the battle. And even then, they're going to run into the Battle of the Bulge. They're going to get slowed down. 
We're going to have a hard time crossing the Rhine as the Russian steamroller goes inexorably. You know, if Stalin had a mind to do it, he could beat them. I'm pretty sure of that. He could have beat them to Berlin. Politically, it would not have been the thing to do because Stalin wants to stay on good terms with Roosevelt. So a race for Berlin is not, not what he has in mind. Um, I don't think we can really have a proper academic dispute about that. Stalin wanted, Roosevelt saw this Yalta experience as indicating that the United States and the Soviets would march together from this point. At any rate, everybody would march together and the United States would call the tune and the Soviets and they would be singing the same tune. There's another map that shows the the Minsk and uh, have we got Minsk on this map? Well, yes, there it is. Minsk and Normandy, about the same. Maybe the Soviets a little closer, about the same distance to Berlin at that point. The great struggle of friends, the great combination, conjunction, convention, meeting of friends, uh, the big three, Soviets and the Anglo-Americans, and the Soviets as the great heroes so liberating the camps, concentration camps, full of their Jewish and other victims. They are the great warrior liberators. Hail to the warrior liberators, this, uh, this uh, poster says. Uh, and there they are marching Soviet, I'm um, excuse me, marching Nazi troops through a field and some Russian peasant women making obscene gestures to these, laughing obscene gestures to these great conquerors for Nazism. Uh, the fabulous parade on the victory over Hitler and VE Day in Red Square. And the Soviet troops with all of the assembled Nazi banners taken from all the different units that they've crushed, all the different military units that they've crushed. They're going to throw them on a heap in front of Stalin on the top of the Kremlin Tower. And the Russian people celebrate in the streets in much the same way that people everywhere celebrated, everywhere in Europe celebrated VE Day and are going to celebrate VJ Day, victory over Japan, uh, in a few months. And this includes merriment. If there is merriment to be had, these two women seem to have a grim look. Maybe they lost husbands, brothers, fathers, sons in this great conflict. But they are the winners. And they have won it not just for Russia, I think, but for everyone else. So let's stop here uh, at uh, the great victory of the Russian Revolution, I guess you have to call it. Remember, you don't want to call it that. Let's discuss that. What's the nature of the victory? How do we interpret all this in terms of the Russian Revolution? Is this the great uh, proving point, um, the point at which the Russian Revolution proves itself to the world, um, historically, morally, or whatever? You know, what does it all mean? How should we interpret it? What does it mean in Russian celebrate in these big parades, celebrate VE Day when we let, just let it pass? What is the date? May 8th, coming up. Are there going to be big celebrations? Well, we're not celebrating anything right now. Are they usually big celebrations? There are, always are in Russia. There always are in Russia. Well, this takes us um, to the end of this discussion. discussion. From this point on, I want to be talking about, about the fate of the revolution, how to interpret the revolution, how historians have interpreted all the things we've talked about so far, what the Russians did in the Cold War. Did they do anything good in the Cold War? Was it all bad? Uh, and lastly, why it was communism fell 
and how the historical review that the Gorbachev regime took up in the 1980s, how that resulted in the fall of the Soviet Union itself. Oddest, oddest thing in the world, uh, but very much a topic that would be of interest to us as historians. So we'll take those topics up soon. Um, stay strong. Stay under this quarantine. Keep up your fighting spirit. Engage your brains. Think, write, and fight.